Well, Robert, it's great to have you join us this morning. And you very kindly spoke to the Dogbone Portfolio Club last Wednesday, and you summarized a very informed piece that you'd received from a friend of yours, and it's entitled One Man's View of China. And for our viewers, I wonder if you could just redo that dogbone portfolio performance of yours. Well, thank you, John. It would be a pleasure. I mean, what we were trying to do was to get to the bottom of what's really happening behind the scenes in China, which very few of us can penetrate, and how the Chinese Communist Party has managed to stay in power by providing economic growth and a huge improvement in living standards for the majority of Chinese. But I think in recent years, the last five or 10 years, the economic experiment they were making with Communist Party rule on one side and economic liberalism on another has reached a kind of impasse because of the rapid advance parallel to what's happening in the United States with their big technology companies of Alibaba and Tencent and other big companies that have monopolized the internet and online e-commerce. And this has created enormous inequalities in China. So their Gini coefficient is actually higher than the United States. Their top 1% owns something like 35% of the GNP. So that is a big problem for Xi Jinping if he continues to espouse communist principles. And I think that he has come up with this common prosperity for all policy, which is trying to restore the economic vitality of the rural regions. Now, I think that what, what was interesting about this essay that we shared with your members last month was that our colleague, who's a Singaporean Chinese who lived in Shanghai for over five years and really knew the Chinese culture and, and economy very well, says that the majority of Chinese don't mind the lack of privacy, the total control of the internet and all that that happens in China. They accept that for the sake of a better lifestyle and, and more freedoms than their parents had. But we may be getting to the point where the Chinese government runs into disappointed expectations of the younger generation, I think. But having said all that, the majority of Canadian and American investors, international investors, are very negative on the Chinese equity market at the moment. And we take a contrarian view and say, well, if all the foreign investors did sell out, which they aren't doing, by the way, the Chinese market is still quite attractive on a valuation perspective. If you leave out the politics and you say, well, the H shares in China, the Hong Kong listed Chinese companies, like all the big oils and banks and, and technology companies, are selling on an average PE of seven times. So for me, there is value to be found in China. And I think that the flow of Chinese savings which is trillions of dollars that are locked up in China, will be into equities because the property market is undoubtedly cooling off. It wasn't just the Evergrande case where they couldn't pay their the loans. I think there is a genuine slowdown, particularly in the sort of second line cities, third tier cities, not so much in Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen and, and Guangzhou. I think that we're going to see softness and maybe some fall in Chinese property prices. So that has been the main asset class for the majority of Chinese savers and investors, that many of them have bought two or three apartments and rent them out or keep them. And there isn't that much mortgage debt there. But, you know, clearly the problem comes with the fact that the Chinese government and their municipalities have been getting 30, 40% of their income from the sales of property or, or auctions of, of land, which is very much the Hong Kong model, which they found in 1997, and they translated it into China on a scale 100 times larger. So Chinese government revenues will be weak. Chinese growth will come down from maybe 10% in the last 20 years to maybe five or a little bit lower, but Chinese equities are not unattractive. And I think that we're looking at biotech, medicine, technology, and AI and things like that, areas where the Chinese government is determined that they will catch up. Semiconductors, very important to them, 
whereas education, the internet, possibly healthcare, are subject to unexpected policy changes and controls on their profitability. So we weren't invested in TAL education, which went from $90 to $3 in about a month. But we are invested in Wuxi Biologics or Syllogy, which is a cloud play in China. We ought to look beyond the political factors in making investment decisions and just look at the earnings growth, the valuations, and the potential for some of these Chinese companies to become much larger in their own domestic economy. Now, what percent of your bamboo strategy is allocated to this focus group of Chinese shares? China currently is 26% of our bamboo fund strategy. And we're building up India, which is nearly 18%. We have about 10% in Taiwan and in Korea, respectively. And we're also building up Southeast Asia, which I've always regarded as the third leg of, of the stool in our Asian strategy. So Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam are building up again to about 15 to 20%. And I think I've mentioned on the call with your Canadian colleagues that Vietnam is possibly the most exciting economy in Southeast Asia with 8% GNP growth and a, a relatively immature stock market. But we've made 85% in our Vietnamese shares this year and I think it's just beginning. I think it's a, a real catch-up situation where manufacturing is shifting out of China for textiles, shoes, electronics, clothes, and so on, to Vietnam. It's 100 million population, much lower wages, and a keen, eager, young consumer population. I think when you visit Vietnam, you feel this is really an exciting economy, which is where China was 20 years ago. So. That and Indonesia, which is a prime beneficiary of higher energy prices, Indonesia is, is benefiting a lot from uh, flows of foreign capital. We, we don't have any investment in Thailand, Malaysia, and only one stock in Singapore. And do you have a sliver in Australia? Yes, we have a very nice hedge, John, in about 6% about <laughs> in two of the leading Australian gold mines. And I'm happy about that because they've been coming up very strongly in the last few days after a rather miserable year. But that's my hedge against inflation in Asia. And I think the Australian golds will do very, very well. Now, while you have 18% of your Asia bamboo strategy in India, you right. have a separate fund, yeah. the Indian Ocean Fund, which is dedicated to India. Correct. And this is such an important investment vehicle yeah. and it would seem to be a, a must have for uh, global investors well thank you i mean I, I think it's been going for five years uh, it's about a hundred million dollars it's made 25 percent this year and we shifted the uh, strategy about three years ago under bratin sanyal my colleague who now runs it from being a much more regional small cap small frontier market type of fund where India was 60, 70% and we had Bangladesh, we had Pakistan, we had Sri Lanka and we had Vietnam. And now it's 95% India and predominantly in liquid large cap stocks in India and 5% in Vietnam. So this year it's done extremely well. I mean, for the last two or three years, it's really been beating its benchmarks. And I think we've got some outstanding positions in technology in India, in Tata Consulting, Infosys, HCL Technology, Wipro, all the big software names in India. We've got a good exposure to the banks, HDFC, ICICI, and some of the smaller banking groups. We've got uh, consumer staples, and we've got pharmaceuticals and, and property, which is very hot in India at the moment. So I think standing back and looking at India today, Mr. Modi, who's been in power now for about seven years and probably get reelected to a third term of five years, is doing very well. He's cutting taxes. He's cutting bureaucracy. He is energizing and, and linking up India in the sense that all the villages have been 
connected to electricity, all the individuals have got bank accounts. Over a billion Indians have opened their own bank accounts. And the Arda system, which is a national ID system, enables them to receive direct payments from the government uh, subsidies for, for rural constituencies and farmers. And this is making a huge difference to India. It's cut out the middlemen, it's reduced corruption, and I see the spending patterns in the country in India much stronger than they have been in the past. So that obviously benefits Unilever and, and the people who are making tractors and seeds and fertilizers and people like that. So all in all, I think India is expensive. It's done very well this year. It's on a high PE. But when I look forward and I think of the earnings growth in 2022, 2023, I think that's justified. So a price earnings growth ratio would put India on a reasonable valuation. So I'm inclined to feel that whatever happens in China or the West, India will continue growing because it's 90% a domestic economy, 1.4 billion young consumers who are just getting to that takeoff point of consumption, which is over $2,000 per capita, where they spend on travel, on consuming consumer goods and on cars, on housing, on mortgages and on investment products. So that the number of retail investors in India has doubled in the last six months or something. So there's a huge flow of domestic funds into the Indian market. And I feel very bullish about India over the next five or 10 years. Now we should explain that your funds are for accredited investors only. Right. And that there is a class of shares for U.S. investors and a class for offshore investors as well. Yes. So we've got quite a few individual investors from the States. We've got a family offices from Hong Kong and Australia. And we've got obviously a registered U.S. mutual fund under the Delaware jurisdiction. So we try to look after our North American clients in a very transparent way. And we've got a fairly low fee base on the bamboo fund, no performance fee, it's a 1% fee. So I think that's helped it really outperform consistently. We have done 110% over five years compared to a 60% benchmark. So my aim is consistently to produce 12 to 15% returns for our investors. And I'm proud of the fact we've consistently outperformed the Asia X Japan. It's a stock picking strategy. We have 25 great companies around the Asian region. We generally stick to those. I mean, our biggest position is Taiwan Semiconductor, for example, which I think is the finest company in the region. It's made about 350% while we've been holding it. And we're trying to identify the same type of companies in India and in Southeast Asia, which have long-term growth prospects. Those returns are coming from the best that you can find. Absolutely. And we make mistakes. We, we sometimes buy things that don't work out. And I cut losses very quickly at 10%. I'm looking always for new candidates for our portfolio. We've just been looking at a very relatively small new listed company in Singapore. And that's about a 6 billion market cap. So it's quite small compared to Taiwan Semiconductor. But I think it's important that we're always on the forefront of new names, new ideas. And you were with your bamboo strategy in China last year on the yes. cusp of some very interesting technology, yes. medical technology companies. Well, I've still got Wuxi Biologics, but I cut a lot of the internet names. I mean, we made 50% in, in 2020. And, and I think we had almost half the portfolio invested in these Chinese internet and medical names. But it's been very difficult to navigate this year because we've had a couple of sharp drops in the spring and again in the in august i've really trying to refine it down to the the names i'm really comfortable in china and we've got a couple of names one is a mining company which does copper and gold and one is an oil drilling equipment company which is the only domestic oil equipment company it's sort of the chinese equivalent of schlumberger and i think those two are very interesting because i believe that commodity prices will continue to rise. And I've seen estimates by JP Morgan that oil will go to 120, maybe 150. 
And China is trying desperately to increase their domestic production because they're importing so much. And on the other side, they are apparently stockpiling metals, industrial metals like copper, but also the precious metals like gold and silver. Robert, what is the rate of inflation in China at the moment and also in India? Well, I saw a report this morning, if I can find it quickly for you, which says that food prices in China are rising quite fast. By that, I mean, I think inflation is up to about 5% in both countries. So in real terms, rates in India are still positive, but in China, which are about three, three and a half percent, they're slightly negative. I think that's an important factor when we estimate stock markets, because I mean, the US stock market has basically been benefiting from very, very low rates. And in real terms, as inflation picks up, those rates are negative. So I think this is also true in Asia. Although there are peripheral signs that some central banks are tightening, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, I think, UK. In Asia, I haven't seen any big rate rises yet. And I think, if anything, the Chinese central bank, PBOC, will pursue a more dovish policy because of the anxiety about the property market. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India has been fairly consistently hawkish. They, they didn't print that much money. They kept rates up at 6 7 8%. So I think that's why real rates in India are positive, but the Indian stock market is still doing very well. It would seem that the Indian and your bamboo strategy are natural hedges to North American and, and European markets. And the, you know what I always go on about is the fact that your backyard is really half the population of the world. Well, that's and true, John. Yeah. What I find fascinating as a Canadian is that there are a lot of very substantial accounts that do recognize that fact, but there are also a number of investors who basically say, well, we don't want to touch over there. It's, yeah. it, it's frightening. And having been both to India and China, you just realize the immensity of the market and the dynamics of those economies. I just say to myself, why would people not at least start with a sliver allocation to those markets? Well, of course, I agree, John. I mean, I moved to Hong Kong 40 years ago next March, and I was astonished as a young man why, what was going on around me. The Chinese family business is working 18 hours a day sometimes, tax rates of 15%, tremendous 50% savings. The work ethic, the family culture, the sense of this enormous energy powering so many companies. And that was just in little Hong Kong. So I started to think, what will happen if China allows people to have companies and build up their wealth? And you know, I wrote the first book, uh, East West Pendulum, in 1991. And we never thought it would happen that quickly. But boom, Deng Xiaoping announced the following year to get rich is glorious. And suddenly, China was on a capitalist path. And we had 30 years of extraordinary growth. And the same thing happened, funnily enough, in India. Rajiv Gandhi's government had a foreign exchange crisis in the summer of 91. And they needed to open up to Western investors. So it was a big change, of course. India had been the socialist Raj allied to Russia. And suddenly they turned to America and to Britain and Canada and said, we we need foreign investors, we need to open up our capital markets and so on. So that also was a starting gun for me. And so my company was China and India. And it still is that basic vision. These are the two big neglected emerging markets. And you know, unlike Brazil or Russia, they're not dependent on commodity prices. And they've got a better work ethic and they've got a consistent growth and population growth and income growth and savings. And that combination, I think, is a magical one to support 
the development of capital markets, which is mainly dependent on local savings, local investors, which is what I was trying to emphasize before, that both the Bombay Stock Exchange and what's happening in China is not dependent on foreign investors. It's dependent on local savings, and that's very key to the future. Well, I should mention that with 40 years of experience in that part of the world under your belt, this isn't just a flash in the pan, and you did sell your predecessor company to the Bank of Montreal, yeah. and you're still going strong. And <laughs> that's a the superb summary, and we'll just try and get people to pay attention for you because it's uh, thank you so much, John. It's fabulous, and we're a great supporter, and we really appreciate it. <laughs> just to end this, Robert, tell us what you're putting together for the. Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Well, I'm not ashamed to be a passionate monarchist, John. And in the Golden Jubilee in, in the summer of 2002, I gave her an engraved bowl, a glass engraving, which apparently she liked. And this time I thought, she's 95. <laughs> she doesn't really want a lot of gifts. But I thought I'd write some stories for her. And it begins in Scotland, which is, you know, her mother was Scottish. She's very attached to Scotland. And then I go through Wales and Ireland and England, and then to the communities, the Indian and Pakistani communities in England, the Jewish community, and various dependencies like St. Helena, Gibraltar, and of course, Canada and Australia. So I've got stories from each region that complement this multifaceted, about 20 stories now, view of the United Kingdom and how it's changed and how so many immigrants like from Hong Kong appreciate what Britain has to offer in terms of freedom and economic opportunity. All fascinating. We'll stay tuned. Okay. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, John.